Hello, can you briefly introduce yourself and where we are? Sure, I'm Claire Latinay. We are in my backyard, a little bit of a wild garden. Um, I am an assistant professor of landscape architecture at Cal Poly Pomona. I practiced landscape architecture for 15 years before joining the faculty there. And I wrote the book, Schools That Heal, Design with Mental Health in Mind. Uh, we are here to discuss your recently published book, Schools That Heal, Design with Mental Health in Mind. This book is specifically and intentionally not categorized as a landscape architecture book, but rather written as an accessible book for school administrators, parents, and designers alike. Uh, Claire, can you describe how you first came to focus on this subject as a research subject and how it paralleled your career as a landscape architect? Sure. Well, I, I came to landscape architecture a little bit late. Um, I was raising three small children in suburban Charlotte, North Carolina, where, which at the time in the mid 90s was growing dramatically. It was the fastest developing city in the country at that time. And my boys were struggling with asthma and eczema and I just was really concerned about the environmental health of our um, of their immediate environment, but also the walkability of our suburb and or lack thereof. And I started getting involved in um, community planning and advocacy boards for pedestrian safety through, you know, organizations like the Charlotte Area Transportation System. And that's when I discovered landscape architecture um, through Anne Spurn's book, The Granite Garden. And within a year I had applied for and been admitted to Cal Poly Pomona's landscape architecture department for their MLA program, which was focused on ecological planning and, and regenerative design. Um, and, and my intention for going to school was very much to understand these larger ecosystematic issues and solutions so that I could focus on making the world a healthier place for my own children and, and other people as well. Um, and that was, you know, remained my focus through, through graduate school and through practice while I was working at EPT Design and Studio MLA. I was very much um, involved with projects that revolved around sustainability, equity, um, climate resilience, and schools were part of that. Um, and at the same time, my own children were going growing up in Los Angeles schools and struggling with their own mental health issues, um, as is common in my family. And the school environments where they went were not only really different from the ones I had gone to in in Columbus, Ohio and, and North Carolina, but they were also um, just really barren, devoid of life. And it felt like such an easy opportunity to create places that were healthier for children, more inspiring and healthier for the environment too. And because schools are spread out throughout our communities, um, they are, they just kept reappearing in my mind as the, the perfect place to start solutions around public health and equity and climate resilience um, that could also address students' mental health and physical health. So. Yeah, you mentioned in the introduction to your book, your own personal experiences mm -hmm. that you were describing and how, you know, through your own lived experience, you became passionate about this topic and I think I know that you are also now a pro professor and students or many students often are, are searching for areas of interest or, or a topic of research within their field. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of I don't know, recommendations do you sometimes give? It, it's just, you know, it's sometimes not something you have to necessarily seek out or choose, but something that you just sharpen your focus or, or kind of gravitate towards to, through your own experiences in a way. Yeah, I think this is one of the 
my primary goals as a as a teacher is to really find the issues and experiences and opportunities that each of our students bring with them. We're so lucky at Cal Poly Pomona because we have, you know, a a large program and our students come from all different areas and walks of life and um, I learn from them every class I teach. Um, one of the things I've found in researching design strategies for mental health is that creating a sense of belonging is one really important theme. And as a teacher, um, teaching landscape architecture, one way to do that is to really, um, what they call in education, flip the course. And instead of being you know, posing as the expert and just giving lectures on material that you know in and out, um, creating an en environment where you can learn from each other as a cohort, you can learn from your students and you can really draw out your students' experiences to become part of the conversation. And in this way, um, in our programs, we can create a sense of belonging for our students, but also learn from them. We're a Hispanic serving institution and most of our students identify as Latino or, or Latina. And um, so, and they come from LA County, San Diego County, Riverside County, all different types of neighborhoods and have so much to bring to us as a program, but also as a profession to raise our understanding, raise our awareness of the issues that these next generations are facing. Right. In, in your writing throughout the book, you also mentioned this concept of mm -hmm. a sense of belonging for students. And it's great to hear that you bring that into your own classroom and just wanted to highlight how important that is uh, it, beyond just representation, but actually creating that, that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. So you start your book by outlining nine strategies for why we should design with mental health in mind. And many of them highlight the multiple benefits this approach has, making it seem, like you mentioned, a no-brainer from quality education to ecological benefits, economic benefits, and maintenance pros. Um, however, the paradigm shift required in school budgeting and existing ways that maintenance is performed sometimes seems challenging to change at best. Can you talk about how this area of friction unfolded in your research and in writing this book? Yeah, about maintenance in particular? Yeah, and about the, the path, you spend a few chapters about the path to implementation and that seems like such a critical piece uh, in this. Yeah, I, as as we know, uh, so many of us in landscape architecture practice run into this in different forms. But in schools, it sort of has its own, its own, um, I guess, infamous position for with anybody who's really trying to make school environments better. Um, the maintenance piece is, it's almost like school administrators or, or district facilities um, decision makers, it's like they, you know, they run across the same proposals by designers constantly. And just as we as designers hear the same reasons why not to plant anything that might potentially die or drop a leaf or um, change over time from when you when you um, when you think about the administrator's point of view and really put yourselves in their shoes um, it allows you to do two things one is to see where they're coming from um, the maintenance piece this is going to get to the maintenance piece in a minute but from a administrator point of view, you're a designer who's working on this project for 12 months. Um, and a lot of schoolyards are ch transformed actually through parent and community energy. And so school administrators often face this issue where they um, get this really enthusiastic parent and they want to bring in 
a raised garden or an edible garden or habitat garden and they take care of it for the six years their child is at that school and then they move on and the garden no longer has a, a champion. Thinking about where the administrator is coming from is useful um, because we have to get better at explaining why it's so important to have nature-based living systems on school grounds. The maintenance piece, it's like, it's become a running joke with any nonprofit or design, you know, professional who's trying to make change in school. Um, in Los Angeles, we have a coalition of nonprofits and academics um, working to really try to create that holistic change with a focus on Los Angeles Unified Schools and other county schools. And anytime maintenance comes up, you know, we have a tendency to just be like, oh, maintenance, um, because it's so frustrating to know, to really understand that there's so many ecological and human health benefits to natural systems on school grounds, and yet, um, and be stopped by the M and O person who's, who just wants to say, we don't have money for maintenance. So it's both frustrating and crucial that we as designers and advocates come up with the solutions. And one of them is definitely around funding. Um, it's ironic that often schools and agent, city agencies as well will have plenty of money or even, you know, universities will have plenty of money to do a capital improvement, like build a facility, um, put in a landscape, put in a big plaza. But they don't have, with that, the maintenance funds to cover the long-term care. So one thing we need to advocate for is including funds for maintenance in any bond measure um, proposition, um, grant, you know, state resource grants, any language where you're asking people to explain what their funds are going for, it's really important to include maintenance as part of that. And, um, and there are good examples. Measure, Measure W in LA County includes maintenance. For schools, one of the easy ways to think about covering maintenance costs of landscape and living systems is to incorporate them into the curriculum. Because anything, a cl any classroom space or learning space is covered by the general budget, the general funds. So experts, you know, like Sharon Danks from Green School Yards America, Jamie Zaplatosh from Children and Nature Network, they're always advocating for use the school grounds as well for learning because it benefits learning. It benefits belonging. It gives students a different way of interacting with their studies. But it also means that you can tap into that general fund to take care of that landscape. The other thing to think about with maintenance is that there are precedents. Um, Japan is one where students take care of the landscape and the whole school. They sweep and take care of their learning spaces. Yeah, um, that's really beautiful. Yeah, and yeah. are trained to you know, really be, be the caretakers of their, their, their school and by extension their community. And I think that's something that ha offers so many opportunities, not just with the children that are going to that school, but also with um, vocational training um, like, you know, a, a conservation core might be a perfect partner for a school, a living system. Um, you can think about, if you think about how much, much focus and energy there has been on green infrastructure in the past couple decades, so many of the, so many of the programs that evolved were built around installing solar panels, for instance. And the nature-based systems that are multi-benefit often get left out of the conversation, but they're actually, I think we, most of us in landscape architecture would agree, more, more important in the long run, this holistic integrated approach. And so if we can think about including them in vocational training programs, 
and work opportunities for high school students and the community. I think that opens a lot of doors to covering, figuring out who's taking care of the landscape. And then the other thing, the last thing I'll say about maintenance is so many of our schools that need the most help are in communities that need job opportunities. And if we think about the need for maintenance as an opportunity instead of a hurdle, um, then you can start opening the door to granting agencies or nonprofits or government agencies partnering with schools to hire community members to take care of that of that landscape and the kids that are using it you know from the smallest children to the to teenagers community college students and beyond so. yes and even in Los Angeles outside of educational projects, there's a big push to install native landscapes, for instance. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest pushbacks that you sometimes get is that there aren't specially trained maintenance crews that know how to tend to native plants, so will overwater them in the summer, mm -hmm. and that there's that lack of knowledge and that that could be an opportunity for schools as well. Yeah. Have, you, have you found any precedents of of teachers or school administrators reaching out to nonprofits or vocational training groups? I know of one precedent, and that's the Council for Watershed Health in LA County. Um, they have done some training with LA Unified landscape managers to do that very, for that very reason. We have such a unique ecosystem. We actually have many unique ecosystems here. And, um, but I think this is a relevant solution for anywhere in the world that, um, you know, what we teach in school, there's been such a push to standardize what students learn across, across our country. And that ha might have benefits, but it also misses this opportunity to be really honed in to train our teachers and um, facilities managers about the unique natural systems. That we, that people survived on for millennia here, in our region, and we still have, you know, connections to those original people that we can tap into, and and hire for their own expertise and bring them into our school communities to teach all of us how to better manage our landscape systems. It's a great opportunity. And in addition to green living infrastructure that is so important. Your book also puts forward this idea of social infrastructure and schools at an urban planning scale mm -hmm. becoming potentially community hubs or even refuges in times of greater climate crisis, floods, or any other heat waves, any other events that are becoming more and more common. And I thought that was a really powerful idea um, that, that we've seen even this summer instances mm -hmm. where having that kind of infrastructure or place where the community can go to be of real help. You know, when I was in graduate school, I just will never forget Joan Woodward's definition of resilience, um, you know, and her work on resilience and really thinking about how to plan and design landscapes that will survive and bounce back after disruption and the solution a regenerative solution to that is designing small redundant systems that overlap so that you're not dependent on for instance our one gigantic energy grid that if too many people use it you know where you have blackouts in the entire northeast of the country but all of these smaller decentralized systems that work together and back up, back each other up um, in terms of, in moments of failure. And schools, um, this, this is one of the things that kept drawing me back towards schools from really even in graduate school, my um, capstone project included a middle school. And it's an opportunity to create these community-based community support systems because they are spread out 
even in rural, rural areas, they are, they're spread out pretty evenly across counties and regions. And, um, and they provide a real opportunity to bring people together, not just while students are at school, but the whole community. Um, I've been talking to Bob Scarfo a lot lately, and I reviewed his book probably 10 years ago now. Um, he was one of the co-authors of Recreating Neighborhoods for Successful Aging. And this idea that schools belong to the students that are there and the teachers, and then they're locked up after hours and nobody else gets to benefit from them. I, I feel like it's relatively recent, um, driven out of fear, but it's, it really misses the opportunity to take care of our whole community and, and create um, intergenerational relationships between students and their elder community members. And also to, um, for the benefit of the, of our elder community members, but also for the benefit of the students. One of the reasons we often hear that students aren't allowed in this space or to be in that garden or to sit under that tree or go behind the building is because there aren't enough eyes on the school ground. And um, while there's plenty of research that shows that eyes on the school ground isn't, isn't the approach, isn't an evidence-based approach to better student behavior. It's, a, it's an honest fear, right? But what if you, you know, what about those students? My child was one of them. I would get a phone call after, during the school day from the principal, Levi climbed a fence again, and you need to tell him to stop climbing the fence. And I, my reaction as a, his parent who really appreciated his adventurous nature and also knew that he needed to get his energy out he needed to challenge himself he needed to he wanted to be up in that area that was away from everyone where the fence was um my reaction was but i think he's doing something that's healthy for his body and mind like we need to allow these students to do the things that they know they need We've just been trained as grown-ups to think they don't. All that to say, coming back to the idea of community schools, the more we can bring other people into our schools, whether it's adopted grandparents or business owners or um, you know artists, musicians, there are a lot of precedents that have that are showing that that works to build community and give students these informal mentorship op opportunities that can be lifelines, really. And also the, f the fact that schools sometimes may be the only opportunity for a park or green space in a community that could, like you said, benefit mm -hmm. all of the residents that can go there after hours yeah. and enjoy that space while interacting with students as well. It That's just right. seems like a win-win. That's situation. right. We, I mean, our cities are, are park poor. There's, there are all these reports that show we need more, more nature and access to nature in our cities. And COVID-19 has definitely showed us that people want to be outside. And so the communities that are struggling the most with trauma and poverty and who, who benefit the most from access to nature don't necessarily have it at their doorstep. So the school can be that opportunity if we're allowed to open it to a joint use agreement with a local parks agency or create a community contract so that they can take care of that, that school. Um, and then coming back to your idea, this idea of the community resource hub, the, a green schoolyard, it really has exponential impact opportunity because if you can take out the asphalt and the concrete and replace it with living nature-based systems to provide habitat and local food and clean water and store water and harvest energy you are you're creating a little a little resilience hub there in the community and then you're showing all the students every single student that goes to that school from here on out a real proof 
you know, of what a healthy future can look like. And that's important on a couple of levels. One, that then they have this baseline that they can take everywhere else they go in the world. But the, the other thing is, it shows them that we as the adults in their lives care about their health and well-being and care about their future on this planet. You know, my, um, my 24 year old asked me a few months ago whether I thought he was, he and his generation were gonna make it to old age. And wow. it just kind of, I mean, I, I know, I have, I've studied and know that young people are struggling with eco-anxiety, but the way he asked, when he asked me that question, that straightforward question, will we make it to old age because of the climate crisis? Um, it just floored me. Like this is the level of concern is not, it's not some far away abstract idea for our young people. It is terrifying for them. They, they are trying to decide whether it's worth it to have children. They're trying to decide whether it's worth it to go after a career. Well, you know, I mean, this is, this is one, one of many anxieties that this generation carries. And it's in creating nature filled, um, welcoming, nurturing, inspiring schools is a real solid way we can tell our young people we care about you and our planet right where you are every day. Yeah, that's such an important point. I, I want to get back to also to the implementation of these nature-based schools. Mm -hmm. One thing that in communication you mentioned with school administrators, parents, and all these different stakeholders is that everyone has their own language and their own set of vocabulary, mm -hmm. including landscape architects especially. Mm -hmm. and. You, you mentioned an example of the designing schools for mental health workshops in Los Angeles in 2018. And can you describe the learning or the common language that was built through this and your own role in this workshop? Sure. This was a workshop that I organized. I started thinking about it during my fellowship for, through the Landscape Architecture Foundation. And I think it came to fruition the following fall. And it was um, intended to bring people from all different disciplines together around schools. So we invited um, landscape architects, architects, teachers, school district administrators, public health experts, um, nonprofits, government agencies, and we brought them in and had a morning session where um, Sharon Danks talked about her work with Green Schoolyards America. Um, Professor William Sullivan from the University of Illinois came and talked about his work measuring, like quantifying stress levels using, using um, body measurements of students and the impact of views, windows, um, windows in classrooms to green versus not green. Um, and then we had, we had Professor Marcy Rainey talked about her research on our two local elementary schools and the impacts that the living schoolyard had on physical and mental health, social health. And a few district, Los Angeles Unified School District people talked. Um, including Mary Jane Puffer, who leads LA Trust for Children's Health, which works in partnership with the district for mental and physical health um, of students. And then in the afternoon, we broke them up. Um, we, when, they, when people signed in, they took a dot um, according to a colored sticker, a colorful sticker, according to what their discipline was, whether they're, are you a nonprofit, a designer, um, a teacher? And so then in the afternoon, we had a workshop where everyone had to find a group with all, everybody had to be a different color dot. So 
we mixed mixed everybody up into these interdisciplinary groups and workshopped around um, a few key issues. Like what is, what's the school you care most about? It might be the school where you teach, the school in your neighborhood, the school where your kids go, the school where you went. Um, what does it feel like? What would you like to like it to feel like? Ideally, if you could, if you could tomorrow wake up and it, the school was exactly the way you wanted it to be, what would it look like? What are the hurdles to getting there? What are the opportunities? What can you do? And then what action will you do when you leave today? And that workshop, we, we got some great ideas around um, not just what people want, but what, what they feel like they have the power to do. And one of the things that all of us have the power to do is talk to other people. But we can only be effective in talking to other people if we remember that, you know, this person didn't spend three years in landscape architecture school and then 15 years of practice talking about LID and, you know, MAWA, whatever it is that your the acronym is. And, um, and if you're an educator, designers often don't understand about trauma-informed education or the kinds of things that a teacher has to deal with on a daily basis or a student. So really getting back into this mindset, um, this, you know, in journalism, you learn how to teach, how to write at a fifth grade level. Um, this is what most newspapers are written to, a fifth grade level. So if you imagine talking to your 10 year old self or your 10 year old son or your 10 year old sister, how would you explain these things? How would you explain these concepts that we think are so complicated um, in a way that anyone can understand? And they're actually, the concepts are actually not, not complicated. Students understand it. Young people understand what we're talking about probably better than most of us. They're still tapped into their, their sort of in, innate needs and often know how to express them until we sort of squelch that. Um, this is the reason why I love working with, with students in schools and seeing, because even the youngest elementary school students are so articulate about what they want their school to be and feel like and what they want to do there. It's really amazing. So through some of the conversations that you observed at the workshop, what were some of the, either like a, um, something that struck you the most or one of the more surprising outcomes that you found from at least those preliminary co conversations? I know you acknowledged it was just a first step in a mm -hmm. longer process, but what were some of the encouraging things you saw emerging from that? I think that one of the main things that came out of it that was really maybe not surprising, but um, were the relationships and connections that were built. Like just, just getting people in the same room at the same table is more powerful than we think. I actually think that the outcome that was the most important was that circle, getting people in the same room. Um, I also, I mean, I, yeah, I, I've heard for, I still hear from people that are impacted and doing the work, doing different work around because of that workshop. Um, I think the, the lesson too, that really s comes to the forefront whenever I think about that workshop is that one of the experts in the room corrected or like one a community member got up to say something about fences and not wanting fences in, in her school. And one of the experts in the room sort of denied her experience as a community member or her understanding as a community member and started kind of telling her why we needed fences around schools. And that struck me, um, I'm sure it was well-intentioned, 
maybe, but it struck me and I actually was moderating the conversation at the time and I sort of had to find a gentle way to cut this person off because it was, it's something that we do as professionals and as decision makers un unconsciously. We put ourselves in the, in the position of expert and we forget or we don't realize. We need to actually listen to the community. Like they are the clients. They should have the decision-making power, not the school district, you know, not the designer, the community. So that, I think that just, it just said so much in that moment about the power and lack thereof <laughs> of listening. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that's really come into focus and more become more important since then, especially in the the past year and a half. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it is interesting how the listening also goes back to just the sense of belonging and ha making mm -hmm everyone at the table feeling like they belong and that their experience is valid. Yeah. One of the, I think, I'm sure I mention it in the book, but I tell my students this all the time too. In, in the school design studio I teach every spring, um, when, when we start working with elementary or middle or high school students, there's always a moment every single time there's a moment when those students uh, in some way or another just stop in their tracks and sort of realize like realize and express to their teacher if not one of my students or myself like i can't believe you're listening to me you know there's this like moment of shock like i can't believe you're asking me about my school and you're listening because my students will, will they'll be taking notes and getting guided around by the students, whether they're five or 18. And every single time, no matter how old that student is, that student group, there's a moment where they just kind of express how sort of shocked and, and grateful they are because they feel heard. And this, the teachers that work with them, that are our, our school partners, their teachers, um, they express it too. They, they always communicate to me after my, my students were just so grateful and amazed and they just couldn't believe you were listening to them, that, that their opinion mattered. That's, yeah, that's probably so the most important way to show mm -hmm. belonging, to listen and, and allow somebody to feel heard, give them that gift. It's really easy, but it's, it's really easy once you realize that it's powerful. I think the, the switch for our, for our profession and for most people is really trying to absorb how powerful that is and how um, rare. And I'm watching Pepper explore the yard like, what's she going to do next? It'll <laughs> be, be a funny little creature in the background <laughs> up the stairs down the stairs <laughs> she's doing her rounds she's yeah. wondering where levi is he's not home right now it is it's difficult to get much further into this interview without acknowledging that we are currently still in the midst of the covid 19 pandemic have been living through it for a year and a half and are at this moment of this tenuous beginning of the school year where many schools are reopening to in-person learning with precautions and maybe backtracking and, and trying again. But in light of all this, since your book was released earlier this summer, uh, have you gotten any feedback or how has your research been received in light of this? And mm. are you seeing any actions or lessons learned this fall as opposed to maybe last fall in the pandemic? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, there has been so much activity over the last year. I'm really lucky to be uh, a research collaborator and um, of Sharon Danks of Green School Schoolyards America. And she, she is one of 
four nonprofits to start in May of 2020, maybe April, the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative. And so over the past year, plus now, over, they have launched and organized 600 plus experts across the country in trying to help schools use outdoor space as a safe way to bring students back. So there has been, there has been a lot of movement um, through, through that, through that initiative, there have been um, really incredible strides. They've been featured in the New York Times, on CBS Sunday Morning, PBS NewsHour. There's just been a lot of excitement and sharing uh, of resources, of schools reopening in Maine, using outdoor spaces, um, all over the country, Canada, the Southeast, everywhere. And um, so it has changed a lot um, in her in their end of year I think it was like a year in review report um, Sharon reported that she felt after 20 years of doing this work that the energy around or awareness or interest in green schoolyards had probably grown tenfold in the last year alone which says a lot about the reception of the work um, of green schoolyards in general. In terms of schools that heal and my my own work, the timing is sadly um, really relevant, but also also we've needed this for a long time. You know, I mean, it it feels. It feels more urgent than ever and also so long overdue. Um, and I do want to point out like William Sullivan's work, Francis Quo's work, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan's work. There's, there's 50 years of research, of analytical and quantitative research showing that we need, that we need to be surrounded by nature and to be seen and to be community minded um, in order to be healthy and safe in our neighborhoods. But it's so, so much of that research is in scientific journals and academic journals. And the reception I'm getting is, I think, heartfelt and grateful that it's like there's a resource. I mean, there's a resource that people can pick up and get an overview of some of the research, get an overview of some pl more planning scale solutions, but also like have a little bit of a how to, how to do this. How do we talk to people? How do we fund these? How do we fund transforming schools? How do we, what do they look like? You know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's both really timely and also overdue like a hundred years. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I I know that going through your book, I you know, personally do not have children in the school system and I'm very unaware of what I know is a very complicated bureaucratic institution mm -hmm. in many different parts of the country. But going through your book it, I was struck of how, how much I was starting to understand or how clearly it was laid out and you could start to really get into some of these concepts. Um, one portion of your book that I, I also really liked was when you lay out all of these case studies of schools to inspire, because I think in the narrative you can get really bogged down with a lot of depressing statistics and the state of current affairs, but there's this real optimism in your writing and the case studies just kind of highlight or give more fuel to people's arguments in making these these natural schoolyards. And some of them that you mentioned, um, just at least two is, is the the rebuilding, uh, the rebuilding and reimagining of Sandy Hook Elementary School mm -hmm. and also a school in 
Japan. And it seems like sometimes moments of great tragedy and trauma in a community are also opportunities for a more radical shift than just rebuilding to the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and that also makes me think of this current time. And is there, is there anything else that we could be learning now or that we're missing? Or what are your thoughts on this messy process from processing the times to taking action? It seems like some people, like you mentioned, the Green School Yards of America are quick and nimble. Um, some people still need to process what's happening in their own families and lives mm -hmm. before taking action. But just just reflecting on, on this current time and how we use that as an opportunity as well. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's a, it's a good question, right? Because we all have our own paces and um, coping mechanisms. And, and we have to learn how to respect and work with each other, even if we have, you know, like my coping me mechanism is definitely imagining change and trying to make change happen. Um, but I also have moments where I just want to spend a few weeks doing nothing except watching movies, you know, <laughs> not <laughs> talking to anyone. So I get it. Um, we need we need the nimble organizations like Green School Yards America in order to help school districts, which are mired in a hundred plus years of tradition and, you know, not a lot of stability in terms of who's working in them. There's often a lot of turnover. We also need um, people like parents. This book is really written as the resource I needed when I was struggling with my, you know, to try to find a solution for my kids. I was really, I was, I was young, I was inexperienced at advocating for myself or them. Um, I didn't know where to start. And I think giving people, no matter what the issue is, whether it's schools or climate resilience or, um, you know, if you have a local part, whatever you're working on, if you can find sort of a way in to people and to give them a, a way forward. I think that's a really great approach. And that could be on a personal level or a community level or a firm level. Um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I think the communication piece, and this is definitely my bias coming from a journalism background, but it's also my lived experience as somebody who really loves people <laughs> and wants to um, wants to help people. That the communication piece itself is something that we're not often focused on. The way we communicate our solutions, and in the in the design professions, for those who are architects or engineers or landscape architects or graphic designers. Um, we often focus on our, the end result or like the imagine, imagining of what a space is going to look like without doing enough justice to the why, why you're making those decisions, um, what could be the impact, what could, what could be the outcomes of this plan. So then, you know, if, if you're talking about future planning, you, you, you'll come across, I found this a lot in schools and um, when I would work on plans for colleges, for instance, you would be given the master plan that was developed five years before, or 10 years before and say, okay, now de design a, a plaza or a campus courtyard with this master plan. And you're reading the master plan and there's, for the landscape, there might be a plan and a plant palette and like an irrigation schedule or like material, you know, furniture. But there's no, here's our big idea. We want to improve health and well-being or we want to reduce the heat island effect or whatever. It could be simple or complex. 
there's there's no like big idea why you're doing it and what the principles are what your impact what you want the impact to be often so i think telling that whole story no matter what your discipline and then we're doing the work to understand the whole story is a real way forward and and now you're in a unique opportunity where you get to educate some of the future designers and landscape architects mm -hmm. how do you incorporate the principles of communication into your own teaching that's it i mean that's I feel like it was a tradition in that program even. It, it certainly a lot of firms are good at telling the story, right? And we incorporated, I incorporated into my classrooms by asking my students to tell their story. So in our, our foundational design studio in the MLA program, um, you know, when I, when most of us took that class, a lot of us took that class, it's really about learning abstract design principles. And this last year and a half, this last year um, since last summer, after George Floyd's murder, my students, our students at Cal Poly Pomona wrote an open letter and really asked our department to do some serious change. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of students across the country did. And one of the things that came up was this opportunity to, one of, this, one of the things that came up for me was the opportunity to switch that foundational design studio into one that really introduced students to each other as a, a cohort, since it was their very first studio, as well as introduced their relationship with landscape, with a place that was important to them, a childhood place and to really explore what made that landscape important to them or um, special to them. So it's, it's a way for them to start telling their stories from the very beginning and to understand that where they came from and who they are when they step into our program is really important and to hang on to that. Um, I think that one of the things as a landscape architecture educator that's really promising is seeing how many, like our faculty meetings are so fun. I mean, we've just become, come together this last year, partly because we're now doing them on Zoom and so many more of us can attend, especially our adjunct faculty who offer so many really important perspectives. So one of the things that we've been doing as a faculty is coming together and really talking about how we're each individually responding to this last year with more student-centered teaching. And the storytelling is definitely an important aspect. Getting to know our students is an important aspect and really questioning our studio practices. Many of us have stopped the tradition of working our students to the bone and then at the end of the semester inviting a bunch of reviewers to come in and shred them you know i never really appreciated that anyway but um but in in a few for a few of us like i've instead started inviting reviewers to a draft presentation of, a, of their initial design ideas and just asking the reviewers to, instead of critiquing, be, the, be a mentor, be a guide. How would you approach this design, this design problem? So that it's really about, it's really about um, introducing them to another perspective besides the ones they're getting in the studio and then allowing them to refine based on the comments that they're getting, refine their presentation and then at the end of the semester, the presentation is, they give a pre-recorded, very short presentation, and it's a celebration instead of a critique or, you know, like this year we've all been questioning the word jury or questioning the, you know, 
Yeah, there's a, there are a lot of things to question. I think we're in a moment of deep transformation in our profession and our educational programs. We're really trying to reimagine how we better serve our students and by extension, the communities that they come from, you know? And, and I think it's, it's just so, it's, it's actually as hard as this last year has been, it's so hopeful. It's so, um, it's been really transformative for me personally and I think for our faculty to get to know each other through, through, through much deeper conversations. And we're being intentional about that. We're, we as a faculty are being very intentional to try to build each other, build a community around each other, get to know what each other's doing in the class and outside of the class so that we can learn from each other and better support our students. Um, yeah, it's been really, I don't know what the right word for it is. Heartwarming is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and also often as, as landscape architects or even when we're students of landscape architecture, we tend to think of the largest possible interventions first mm -hmm. in this imagining process. And one thing that you do in, in, the, in your book is to list all different types of possible projects or in, interventions at a variety of scales that can inspire all. And some, some of which we may not necessarily even consider landscape architecture in the traditional sense. I mean, some of the larger, more typical ones like a, like a rain garden uh, are offered, but it can even go down to something as simple as like a nature inspired mobile in a classroom that currently doesn't have windows, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very inspiring in that people can can do something even with a limited budget and I'm wondering how else you see the role for these interventions and how even smaller acts towards nature-based design can eventually lead to larger projects the smaller I think this was actually I'm going to give credit to my editor Courtney Lix for this idea of the organization organizing the strategies according to like, what could you do tomorrow with zero money? What could you do with a little bit of money? What could you do? What would you do if you had like no, no end of funds, right? It was such a brilliant idea <laughs> from Courtney. And, um, but the idea that you can do things for free, even revealing natural systems or natural flows is, is a really important one. Um, because, yeah, because, because it's like a way in and it doesn't even have to be a natural system. I mean, like I, I love this chair because it rocks and research shows that like rocking, rocking, walking, swinging brings us back into our bodies and anyone who's ever, you know, been a teenager and go visit their elementary school and sit on the swings there with their best friend like how many times how many of you did that growing up yeah how many times do you see the grandparents sitting on the chair swing the bench swing you know um adding a rocking chair is a, a really easy move that might not seem related to nature but actually it is because our minds and our bodies are connected to the environment and it's all, it's all connected. So I think doing things, really easy things like that, that allow people to move their bodies the way they need to, to be healthy, um, or to see a stream running through campus instead of a storm drain under the parking lot. Or watching the leaves fall and letting them lie down there, let, letting them stay on the pavement. My favorite time of year in, um, in my garden is when the orange blossoms drop and create this like April snow of flowers and it just smells amazing. And, and I don't sweep them up until they're all dried up and, you know, way past 
looking like a flower because they're just so beautiful lying there. But we teach our children in these pristine, not really, pristine isn't the word, sterile, stark schools that there's, you can't have pine needles or pine cones on the playground. You know, these are like perfect play elements. Pine needles, pine cones, flowers, grasses. And, and it instills a sense of seasonality too. It does. Connections to the yeah. yearly cycle of, of seasons. Mm-hmm. Especially, is, yeah, in places like LA that it, it might be very subtle drops of leaves or flowers. Mm-hmm. And that's what cues you to different yeah. times of the year. Yeah, and it's really, that and alone is important for our mental health. That change over time, seeing seasons shift is good for us. And understanding them, you know, the school you mentioned in Japan, the approach the school took to heal the community was to teach the students about the natural systems that seemed so scary. And the one of the interesting things about that region is that they had like there were what I thought was really interesting was one of the things is that the community had always for, you know, their entire history that they could, that I could um, glean, placed stones at the highest mark that the tsunamis, the historic tsunamis had reached. And the elders in the community grew up understanding where the tsunami stones were and what the risks were and what to do if there was an earthquake that could very likely, because they knew it could result in a tsunami. But the younger generations had sort of, you know, the elders took it upon themselves to say, we forgot to educate our young, young people. And so understanding the ocean, getting back close to the ocean and close to the water ecotypes was really important. And they had a spring on the, on the school campus that, um, I think that I don't know where it went before they built the wetland, but they recreated a little wetland and made their own little um, wetland ecotope. And the students named it and take care of it and go look at it for science. And they're just really engaged in both their own little school ecosystem as well as the ocean down the road and the river and the ocean. And that's, I mean, I think that's really powerful when you think about like where we are in Southern California, students are really afraid. Children are afraid of the fires. Children are afraid of um, the disasters that they're seeing, whether it's the hurricanes in the Southeast, the fires in the West, um, climate change, flooding, all of the things that they're seeing and hearing about. It's really scary when you don't understand it. So bringing in a little bit of that, of the natural system into your school campus and talking about it. This is what happens every year. This is a regular cycle. This is a regular cycle. You know, the leaves fall, the tree isn't dead. In Southern California, we need to be better about including curriculum that talks about summer being brown, not green. You know, we don't have the same seasons across the U.S. even, let alone the whole world. So understanding the nuances of that can be really powerful. Um, Yeah, and provide an anchor for students. Yes, I'm also wondering if you, can, can you briefly describe your research processes and techniques. I know that this can probably be an entire podcast episode in itself, but in terms of finding some of these case studies or conducting interviews, how many sites were you able to visit or how did you get connected to stakeholders or people to interview? I I know that you were a recipient of the Landscape Architecture Foundation um, fellowship and that Mm -hmm. probably tied into your research, but if you could briefly talk about that and how that all really helped shape the book be what it is today yeah it's kind of funny because when I when I got the fellowship I actually thought 
I knew there was going to be a lot of exploration, but at one point I thought, well, I'll just call William Sullivan and Francis Quo and ask them who, what schools have used their research, you know, what schools have been designed with your research. And I got on the phone, like, you know, like any academic, it took a few weeks, if not months for uh, Professor Sullivan to get back to me. But when he did, I asked him what schools or communities have been designed with your research in mind and he was like he's like honestly I don't know anyone doing that work and I was floored I was just like what (laughs) I thought I would just get a list go visit the schools and do the analysis you know but um I think that that his response was really why this book I think had to happen and um it was actually Courtney Lix the editor of Island at Island Press heard about my work through the fellowship and invited me to write a book before the the end of the fellowship. So while the the fellowship was the impetus to the book, um, the research had already started. The process, it was layered. So my original fellowship proposal had been, I'm going to find out, figure out, you know, strategies concrete strategies to support students' mental health through school design and write an article about it for the general public. This is one of the reasons I got into landscape architecture, actually. I wanted, I was disappointed at how little was written on ecological design and landscape architecture in the newspaper. So, but when I started getting into it, of course, you know, the fellowship for leadership and innovation is I highly encourage anyone with a burning question to apply. It's really a a deep and fun and meaningful process. And it's, I would say less about the research itself and more about learning how, how to find the questions that you're really interested in, learning how to establish a a point of view. So, I mean, so that year was transformative in many ways. It gave me a good grounding, but I still had a lot of work to do to find the concrete design strategies. Like I think, I think I understood the problems pretty well, the problem pretty well after that year. And I outlined some, some barriers and, or obstacles and solutions, but like, it was like a, a good first step. And then the, I, I received another um, smaller fellowship with the Association for Women in Architecture and Design. And that fellowship and Lise Borstein, Bornstein's support and mentorship through that fellowship really helped me um, distill the solutions into a, these three themes, into a, a few key ideas. I don't think the three themes were there yet, but into a few key, key ideas. And she did that by after, you know, after giving, like you have to give a presentation for that fellowship at the end of the year. And during my draft presentation, she was like, okay, 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 but what are we going to do? <laughs> as a designer, what do you want me to do? And I was like, okay, fine, fine. I'll do the strategies. (laughs) And she sort of like pulled them out of me. And, um, and from there, it was a little bit easier in some ways, because I was like, okay, I have the background now and the some concrete strategies. And now it's really about figuring out how to tell a story. It wasn't easy. (laughs) It was easy. I don't know why. I mean, this was a, this has been, you know, this was a four year process from the time Courtney invited me to write, write the book. I thought I would have it done in a year. Well, yeah. (laughs) We tend to. Yeah. The interviews, I mean, frankly, the interviews were, I didn't want it to be a book about research that was all published in academic journals. I wanted it to be personal. 
because it was pers it's a personal issue for me. It's a personal topic for most of us. We all went to a school. For those of us who are parents, it is very personal where we send our children. And um, the interviews were the most fun part. Thinking about people to interview, and a lot of them are, you know, like anything, it's the people I met organically over this process. Um, a, a friend of mine who I'd met through one of my colleagues, one of my peers um, and best friend, uh, is a, a, was a juvenile justice attorney, defense ter attorney, for years. And she's on her own path to transformation. That's Lori Harris. So interviewing her to understand the sort of the end of the school to prison pipeline was really important. Um, one of my interviews came about because I wrote an article during my fellowship about a really tragic event. My son's best friend being shot and killed um, in a neighborhood that I had been visiting the day before in order to figure out where to plant trees. I mean, just that and that article, one, another colleague came up to me after and, and she was just like, you, you have to meet my father, who was a LA County Sheriff's deputy for years and grew up in the same neighborhoods. Um, that interview that I did, that I did that during my fellowship, but it stuck with me and I felt like it had to be included because it was so, it, it really shaped how I thought about telling the story, what was important about the story, you know. When you lose somebody, I had a moment where when we lost when we lost my friend, my son's best friend, I had a moment where I just felt like this is dumb. <laughs> nothing, nothing I'm doing is important or matters. I'm trying to like basically sell trees on school campuses. What the hell, you know? And um, after talking to him and his daughter, I felt like, okay, this, that was really the moment where I realized it has to be bigger than design. Design is absolutely critical, crucial. Nature-based systems in our communities are absolutely crucial, but it's more than design too. It has to also be about the, that sense of belonging. How are we not just designing to invite people to use our spaces, but also including people in the process, including people in the programming, you know, really being active about how we're inviting people into our spaces. There, you include a, a brief transcript or selection from that pivotal interview mm -hmm. in the end of your book. Um, yeah. There's a lot of great quotes in this book. I want to read one quote uh, in, from your book about inspire, inspiring awe in students. And the quote is, uh, around the world as students urge their communities to address ecological destruction, systemic racism, and the capitalist systems that thrive on both, schools provide an opportunity to explore and present new models of building, learning, and living. These new models can inspire students by giving them hope for a healthy and viable future. And while you have a lot of great database statistics and reasons to do all this work throughout your book as well, I just thought that that highlights such a strong motive the, above all data for why mm. this work is so crucial. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, also to conclude, I was wondering if you could talk about your next steps after the publication of this book, how the work continues both as a professor and a proponent for schools that heal. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited to be creating a new collaborative at Cal Poly Pomona. It's based on this group 
called the Emergency Schoolyard Design Volunteers that I formed and organized with um, Green Schoolyards America for the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative. But it's also based on the school design studio that I've been running for a few years. And this, so this collaborative for healthy and inclusive learning environments is a new space to try to bring faculty and programs together because a lot of people are doing work around this you know when you when you start publishing and getting your word your name out there then all of a sudden you find people you find each other um, and I just want a space where all of us can kind of come together and create a uh, like a series of workshops or a, a toolkit or anything, like a, a place where people can collect and store data for the next graduate student who's looking for a thesis to mine it for important discoveries, or it could be a number of things. It's in its um, conceptual stages right now. Mm -hmm. We've received our first funding. We have a home at the Lyle Center for Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona, which is really exciting. Um, I have some key partners, including Green Schoolyards America and Bob Scarfo of Land and Life. Um, Kyle Brown has been a huge mentor. He, he was the former director of the Lyle Center for Regenerative Studies. Um, Pablo LaRoche, who's the current director um, it's really exciting. Jean Yang, who is my dear friend and colleague at Studio MLA, is teaching at the University of Oregon this year, and she'll, she and I will be co-teaching this school design studio in the spring. One of the things the collaborative is going to do is to share um, one or more sample syllabi to help faculty work with school communities to reimagine their their schools um, and end with grant ready, grant ready plans. Um, the school design studio so far has, we've managed to inspire two and a half million dollars of implementation grants for the schools that we've worked with. And I think, I just think about the billions of dollars that are coming down from the federal government that schools have to spend in the next three years. and we can do a lot as designers to help schools figure out the most effective, efficient, inspiring way to use that money to transform their schools. So that's exciting. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we all look forward to seeing this, you know, more and more of these principles get installed on the ground and, and you continuing to help lead the way with your coalition. Thank you. <laughs> towards this. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for, for speaking to us today. You're welcome. It's been a joy. <laughs>